Chapter 22 Our situation as it now appeared was scarcely less dreadful than when we had conceived ourselves entombed forever. We saw before us no prospect but that of being put to death by the savages, or of dragging out a miserable existence in captivity among them. We might, to be sure, conceal ourselves for a time from their observation among the fastnesses of the hills, and as a final resort in the chasm from which we had just issued. But we must either perish in the long polar winter through cold and famine, or be ultimately discovered in our efforts to obtain relief. The whole country around us seemed to be swarming with savages, crowds of whom, we now perceived, had come over from the islands to the southward on flat rafts, doubtless with a view of lending their aid in the capture and plunder of the Jane. The vessel still lay calmly at anchor in the bay, those on board being apparently quite unconscious of any danger awaiting them. How we longed at that moment to be with them, either to aid in effecting their escape, or to perish with them in attempting a defense. We saw no chance even of warning them of their danger without bringing immediate destruction upon our own heads, with but a remote hope of benefit to them. A pistol fired might suffice to apprise them that something wrong had occurred, but the report could not possibly inform them that their only prospect of safety lay in getting out of the harbor forthwith. It could not tell them that no principles of honor now bound them to remain, that their companions were no longer among the living. Upon hearing the discharge, they could not be more thoroughly prepared to meet the foe, who were now getting ready to attack, than they already were and always had been. No good, therefore, an infinite harm would result from our firing, and after mature deliberation we forbore. Our next thought was to attempt to rush toward the vessel, to seize one of the four canoes which lay at the head of the bay, and endeavor to force a passage on board. But the utter impossibility of succeeding in this desperate task soon became evident. The country, as I said before, was literally swarming with the natives, skulking among the bushes and recesses of the hills, so as not to be observed from the schooner. In our immediate vicinity especially, in blockading the sole path by which we could hope to attain the shore at the proper point were stationed the whole party of the black-skinned warriors, with two wit at their head, and apparently only waiting for some reinforcement to commence his onset upon the Jane. The canoes, too, which lay at the head of the bay, were manned with savages, unarmed, it is true, but who undoubtedly had arms within reach. We were forced, therefore, however unwillingly, to remain in our place of concealment, mere spectators of the conflict which presently ensued. In about half an hour we saw some sixty or seventy rafts, or flatboats without riggers, filled with savages and coming round the southern bight of the harbor. They appeared to have no arms except short clubs and stones which lay in the bottom of the rafts. Immediately afterward, another detachment, still larger, appeared in an opposite direction and with similar weapons. The four canoes, too, were now quickly filled with natives, starting up from the bushes at the head of the bay and put off swiftly to join the other parties. Thus, in less time than I have taken to tell it, and as if by magic, the Jane saw herself surrounded by an immense multitude of desperadoes evidently bent upon capturing her at all hazards. That they would succeed in doing could not be doubted for an instant. The six men left in the vessel, however resolutely they might engage in her defense, were altogether unequal to the proper management of the guns, or in any manner to sustain a contest at such odds. I could hardly imagine that they would make resistance at all, but in this was deceived, for presently I saw them get springs upon the cable, and bring the vessel starboard broadside to bear upon the canoes, which by this time were within pistol range, the rafts being nearly a quarter of a mile to windward. Owing to some cause unknown, but most probably to the agitation of our poor friends at seeing themselves in so hopeless a situation, the discharge was an entire failure. Not a canoe was hit or a single savage injured, the shots striking short and ricocheting over their heads. The only effect produced upon them was an astonishment at the unexpected report and smoke, which was so excessive that for some moments I almost thought they would abandon their design entirely and return to the shore. 
and this they would most likely have done had our men followed up their broadside by a discharge of small arms, in which, as the canoes were now so near at hand, they could not have failed in doing some execution, sufficient at least to deter this party from a farther advance, until they could have given the rafts also a broadside. But in place of this, they left the canoe party to recover from their panic, and by looking about them to see that no injury had been sustained, while well, they flew to the larboard to get ready for the rafts. The discharge to larboard produced the most terrible effect. The star and double-headed shot of the large guns cut seven or eight of the rafts completely asunder, and killed perhaps thirty or forty of the savages outright, while well, a hundred of them at least were thrown into the water, the most of them dreadfully wounded. The remainder, frightened out of their senses, commenced at once a precipitate retreat, not even waiting to pick up their maimed companions who were swimming about in every direction, screaming and yelling for aid. This great success, however, came too late for the salvation of our devoted people. The canoe party were already on board the schooner to the number of more than a hundred and fifty, the most of them having succeeded in scrambling up the chains and over the boarding netting even before the matches had been applied to the larboard guns. Nothing now could withstand their brute rage. Our men were borne down at once, overwhelmed, trodden underfoot, and absolutely torn to pieces in an instant. Seeing this, the savages on the rafts got the better of their fears and came up in shoals to the plunder. In five minutes the Jane was a pitiable scene indeed of havoc and tumultuous outrage. The decks were split open and ripped up, the cordage sails and everything movable on deck demolished as if by magic, well, by dint of pressing at the stern, towing with the canoes and hauling at their sides, as they swam in thousands around the vessel, the wretches finally forced her on shore, the cable having been slipped, and delivered her over to the good offices of Tuwit, who, during the whole of the engagement, had maintained, like a skillful general, his post of security and reconnaissance among the hills. But now that the victory was completed to his satisfaction, condescended to scamper down with his warriors of the black skin and become a partaker in the spoils. Two wits' descent left us at liberty to quit our hiding place and recontour the hill in the vicinity of the chasm. At about fifty yards from the mouth of it we saw a small spring of water, at which we slaked the burning thirst that now consumed us. Not far from the spring we discovered several of the filbert bushes which I mentioned before. Upon tasting the nuts we found them palatable, and very nearly resembling in flavor the common English filbert. We collected our hats full immediately, deposited them within the ravine, and returned for more. While we were busily employed in gathering these, a rustling in the bushes alarmed us, and we were upon the point of stealing back to our covert when a large black bird of the bittern species strugglingly and slowly arose above the shrubs. I was so much startled that I could do nothing, but Peters had sufficient presence of mind to run up to it before it could make its escape and seize it by the neck. Its struggles and screams were tremendous, and we had thoughts of letting it go lest the noise should alarm some of the savages who might still be lurking in the neighborhood. A stab with a bowie knife, however, at length, brought it to the ground, and we dragged it into the ravine, congratulating ourselves that, at all events, we had thus obtained a supply of food enough to last us for a week. We now went out again to look about us, and ventured a considerable distance down the southern declivity of the hill, but met with nothing else which could serve us for food. We therefore collected a quantity of dry wood and returned, seeing one or two large parties of the natives on their way to the village, laden with the plunder of the vessel, and who we were apprehensive might discover us in passing beneath the hill. Our next care was to render our place of concealment as secure as possible, and with this object we arranged some brushwood over the aperture which I have before spoken of as the one through which we saw the patch of blue sky on reaching the platform from the interior of the chasm. We left only a very small opening just wide enough to admit of our seeing the bay without the risk of being discovered from below. Having done this, we congratulated ourselves upon the security of the position, for we were now completely excluded from observation, as long as we chose to remain within the ravine itself and not venture out upon the hill. 
we could perceive no traces of the savages having ever been within this hollow, but indeed when we came to reflect upon the probability that the fissure through which we attained it had been only now created by the fall of the cliff opposite, and that no other way of attaining it could be perceived, we were not so much rejoiced at the thought of being secure from molestation as fearful lest there should be absolutely no means left for us to descend. We resolved to explore the summit of the hill thoroughly, when a good opportunity should offer. In the meantime, we watched the motions of the savages through our loophole. They had already made a complete wreck of the vessel, and were now preparing to set her on fire. In a little while, we saw the smoke ascending in huge volumes from her main hatchway, and shortly afterward, a dense mass of flame burst up from the forecastle. The rigging, masts, and what remained of the sails caught immediately, and the fire spread rapidly along the decks. Still a great many of the savages retained their stations about her, hammering with large stones, axes, and cannonballs at the bolts and other iron and copper work. On the beach and in canoes and rafts, there were not less, altogether, in the immediate vicinity of the schooner, than ten thousand natives, besides the shoals of them who, laden with booty, were making their way inland and over to the neighboring islands. We now anticipated a catastrophe, and were not disappointed. First of all, there came a smart shock, which we felt as distinctly where we were as if we had been slightly galvanized but unattended with any visible signs of an explosion. The savages were evidently startled, and paused for an instant from their labors and yellings. They were upon the point of recommencing, when suddenly a mass of smoke puffed up from the decks, resembling a black and heavy thundercloud. Then, as if from its bowels arose a tall stream of vivid fire to the height apparently of a quarter of a mile. Then there came a sudden circular expansion of the flame, then the whole atmosphere was magically crowded in a single instant with a wild chaos of wood and metal and human limbs, and lastly came the concussion in its fullest fury, which hurled us impetuously from our feet, while the hills echoed and re-echoed the tumult, and a dense shower of the minutest fragments of the ruins tumbled headlong in every direction around us. The havoc among the savages far exceeded our utmost expectation and they had now indeed reaped the full and perfect fruits of their treachery. Perhaps a thousand perished by the explosion, while at least an equal number were desperately mangled. The whole surface of the bay was literally strewn with the struggling and drowning wretches, and on shore matters were even worse. They seemed utterly appalled by the suddenness and completeness of their discomfiture, and made no efforts at assisting one another. At length we observed a total change in their demeanor, from absolute stupor they appeared to be, all at once, aroused to the highest pitch of excitement, and rushed wildly about, going to and from a certain point on the beach, with the strangest expressions of mingled horror, rage, and intense curiosity depicted on their countenances, and shouting at the top of their voices, Tekalili! Tekalili! Presently, we saw a large body go off into the hills, whence they returned in a short time carrying stakes of wood. These they brought to the station where the crowd was the thickest, which now separated so as to afford us a view of the object of all this excitement. We perceived something white lying upon the ground, but could not immediately make out what it was. At length we saw that it was the carcass of the strange animal with the scarlet teeth and claws which the schooner had picked up at sea on the 18th of January. Captain Guy had had the body preserved for the purpose of stuffing the skin and taking it to England. I remember he had given some directions about it just before our making the island, and it had been brought into the cabin and stowed away in one of the lockers. It had now been thrown on shore by the explosion. But why it had occasioned so much concern among the savages was more than we could comprehend. Although they crowded around the carcass at a little distance, none of them seemed willing to approach it closely. By and by, the men with the stakes drove them in a circle around it, and no sooner was this arrangement completed than the whole of the vast assemblage rushed into the interior of the island with loud screams of Tekalili! Tekalili!